talk about establishing an enterprise architecture practice. And we're going to, uh, you know, uh, do that on the backdrop of, of talking just a little bit about just what the heck is an architecture framework. And as many may know, that's a, a very overloaded term in the enterprise architecture uh, industry. And so what we've done is we've, you know, tried to uh, at least uh, specify, you know, what are its main constituent elements, and we actually relabel this a little bit. So we call this an architecture practice framework. You know, the things that you need to have in place in order to actually perform enterprise architecture work. And there are four are critical components, uh, a method framework, a skills framework, a taxonomy framework, and a tools framework. And we'll be going through, uh, you know, each one of these uh, in the remainder of the presentation. But, you know, starting off at the very top, uh, we need to have some way that describes, uh, you know, how do we do um, enterprise architecture work? How is that those life cycles uh, initiated, um, performed, and governed? You know, how does the enterprise architecture life cycle integrate with other business and IT life cycles? Because again, if enterprise architecture stands by itself and doesn't influence and impact other life cycles, it will likely degenerate into what we call an ivory tower and not make uh, any uh, impact uh, on the organization. We need to have a skills framework that supports uh, that method that namely identifies the skills and experiences that, um, that enterprise, architecture need, enterprise architects and other participants need to have in order to successfully um, execute the method. And this often includes uh, professional development and certification programs. We need a taxonomy framework. Uh, this is what most architecture frameworks are primarily composed of, so things such as the Zachman framework or Federal Enterprise Architecture or DODAF, uh, mostly focus solely on the taxonomy or alternate words would be a meta model or an ontology. You know, and the, and the, this taxonomy is a way of describing, you know, what are the different kinds of architectural assets that we might want to keep track of within our organization, their relationships, their semantics, metadata, and we often uh, incorporate um, industry standard reference models, for example, as a baseline for that. And then, um, you know, kind of going along with the standard, you know, notion of enterprise architecture really being a business capability, and capabilities need to be uh, are composed of, you know, three chunks. Uh, process people and tools, we need some sort of tooling framework to support that. Um, again, that's uh, aligned with the method, implements the taxonomy, and our experience shows us that this is, again, a suite of integrated tools, and while, you know, we're big fans and big advocates of modeling tools, which are an often a, a, a entry point into uh, enterprise architecture tools, there are a broad range of tools that you need to consider over the long haul as you continue to mature and uplift your architecture capability, particularly around requirements management, repository management, governance management, uh, so on and so forth. So we'll kind of start off by talking about the, the first element. Uh, you need to have a, a, a process framework. And uh, probably no surprise uh, to those that uh, noticed that we were, you know, um, members of the architecture forum at the Open Group and contributed to TOGAF that we'll be, you know, basing some of our discussions here on uh, the content that uh, TOGAF describes. And one of the things that makes TOGAF as an architecture framework particularly um, uh, differentiated in the market is that it has a very uh, robust um, architecture development method. So where other frameworks, again, tend to focus mostly on the taxonomy, they don't really talk a lot about, well, how do you build that taxonomy? And once you've built it, what do you do with it? And if I'm not even sure what enterprise architecture is, how do I create that architecture capability? And that's one of the great things that the ADM uh, has to offer. Uh, the graphic you see on the right is, is traditionally called the crop circle. And it, again, represents, uh, uh, again, a tested, repeatable process for developing architectures. Uh, uh, there's sets of activities for different parts of the life cycle. Uh, one that we're going to talk mostly about today, establishing that initial architecture capability. That's what the preliminary fra uh, phase of framework and principles is about. Then uh, going through phases A through D in particular, uh, where we talk about uh, describing uh, the architecture, both the baseline or as-is or current architecture, and then the future target or uh, 2B architecture. Then when we get into phases E and F, we're talking really about looking at the results of doing architecture description and gathering requirements, and we start to put together a plan that talks about how we're going to realize that target architecture. And then once um, uh, phase F is completed, we're kind of done with what, uh, what we call you know, the big EA, the capital EA, that top-down deliberate intentional process where now we're going to transition 
into the solution delivery lifecycle and have enterprise architecture uh, provide guidance and compliance uh, reviews through that uh, lifecycle, and that's the whole idea behind phase G, implementation governance. And then uh, once we've delivered those solutions, uh, we need to manage change so that when uh, something comes down the pipe, whether it be a change in our business environment or a technology environment or both, that we have a proactive uh, position to respond to that. And actually, uh, one thing that's not really well described by this uh, picture, which you really should think of as a conceptual process model, not to be interpreted literally, i.e. shouldn't necessarily execute this uh, linearly as a potentially waterfall method, um, is that uh, phases G and H are actually operational activities that you need to be performing all the time, irrespective of whether or not you've actually begun an enterprise architecture project, which is really what A through F is about. And the whole idea behind the ADM, again, is to provide the organi organizations the ability to you know, transform and manage their architecture landscape in a controlled fashion in a way that, again, has appropriate responses to changes in our business and technology environment. So in the, in the preliminary phase, framework and principles, uh, the ADM describes a, a very uh, high-level six-step process for establishing the architecture capability, and we'll be going through um, uh, most of this stuff, uh, the remainder of this pro uh, presentation, um, although perhaps not uh, all of these steps in great detail. So starting off, the first thing that we need to do is uh, scope the enterprise organizations that are impacted. So this is really trying to understand the scope of architecture influence. Um, when we're establishing the architecture capability, are there places where either because of um, experience or credibility or just what's going on within the business environment that we are not going to uh, be doing enterprise architecture work? So really trying to make sure we understand um, where we're going to be doing that and other parts of the organizations that are going to be impacted by the new architecture capability. Uh, TOGAF um, has a little bit of information on how to establish uh, architecture governance. Uh, you know, the specification itself tries to be a one-stop shop for everything that you need to know to establish and perform enterprise architecture work, but certainly defers to other bodies of knowledge that have greater depth and detail. So there is an architecture governance framework um, in TOGAF, but uh, we certainly defer to um, uh, COBIT, the Control Objectives for Information Technology, is more of a rigorous, in-depth uh, uh, specification for describing how to do IT governance. But in either way, you know, when someone's establishing an architecture capability, uh, first of all, it's, it's unlikely that this thought has never occurred to anybody within the organization before. And of course, um, in 2014, organizations that have been around for, you know, 100 or plus years, um, probably have you know put propped up enterprise architecture like capabilities uh, multiple times, so maybe we're refreshing it or restarting it this time. Um, and and of course, one of the big ch challenges that organizations have with doing uh, sustaining enterprise architecture actually does have to do with um, effective governance. Uh, we then need to establish and define the enterprise architecture team and organization. So who are the members? Um, who do they report to, where do they work, what are their responsibilities and roles, and as, as many may know, uh, one of the things that's interesting about enterprise ar or architecture in the large in general is that there are so many different qualifications or qualifiers that we use when we describe architects. So there's enterprise architects, business architects, data architects, information architects, application architects, technology architects, infrastructure architects, network architects. So again, you know, hopefully we're able to pull all of those different uh, um, uh, types of roles into a common practice based on a set of generally accepted uh, uh, best practices. Then we need to establish the foundation for our architecture um, governance framework, and that's, uh, we do that by identifying and establishing architecture principles. We then need to tailor um, the selected architecture framework. Um, and of course, if you're looking at the TOGAF standard, uh, TOGAF will be a part of that to those tailoring decisions, and then ultimately uh, implement uh, the architecture tools. Uh, just one uh, little call out on this particular diagram. Uh,